Uh, okay, 802. I think there are 34 more people that I thought would turn up here, so well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, very unconventionally, I'm introducing the great Ian Bradbury. Don't adjust your screen, his hair is really like that. So uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our 11th webinar for East Sussex Eye Group. Uh, it's nice to have you all around. Uh, we are recording the webinar and uh, you can later watch it on the East Sussex Eye Group. There is one CET point available for today's lecture if you're watching it live and the link is registered. Um, so the CET point is available for optometrists, contact, contact lens opticians, and dispensing opticians. Uh, we aim to run the lecture for 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes of questions and answers. So I'll be logging off in a minute after I've introduced the great Mr. Bradbury. Um, and um, then, you know, I'll log back in and we can all ask questions. So. Without further ado, I'd like to um, welcome Ian Bradbury, who's been a dispensing optician. He qualified in 1982. Um, 92. Uh, 92. <laughs> 1992, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he then completed contact lens certificate with the Association of Dispensing Optician before qualifying as an optometrist in 2012. He worked in community opticians before moving to the hospital eye service. He ran the low vision, um, cl low vision Clinic in East Sussex Healthcare Trust and is, uh, was instrumental in developing the service and recruiting the ECLO to the department. He's an ambassador for the trust and is also the deputy head optometrist. He has completed the profession certificate in medical retina um, and he's currently practicing in low vision clinic twice a week and has helped to train numerous members of staff in the um, optometry practice. So, um, to be honest, you don't really need an introduction, Ian. You're a, you're a great man and you're a wonderful human being. So I'm going to let you do this lecture. We've got 43 participants now. So can you, do I stop the video? What do I do, Ian, so you can take over? Um, I can stop your video. You stop your, stop sharing your screen and I will, I'll go to share my screen. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. So thank you very much for that introduction. It doesn't look like you read it at all. It doesn't like somebody gave you that to read <laughs> at all. So it looked like you knew it all. I knew it all, Ian, yes. <laughs> so, so thank you very much all for joining us tonight. Uh, so yeah, as Shah said, my name is Ian. Um, you might want to stop, stop sharing your screen, Shah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'm Deputy Head Optometrist for East Sussex NHS Trust, and I work at Eastbourne and Bexhill and Conquest Hospitals. So tonight I'm going to talk about low vision, a hospital perspective. And uh, I know there's a few people on the East Sussex side group that are registered, but there's a, quite a few people that are registered that are not local to us. So some of the things I'm going to talk about might not be the same in your local area. So I would just suggest sort of looking at what your area um, uh, sort of services uh, are like and, and what uh, they offer. So to start with, I thought I would sort of talk about sort of um, what low vision is. And the World Health Organization um, have got a definition of, of low vision as a person who has uh, low vision is one who has impairment of visual functioning, even after treatment or standard refractive correction uh, and has a visual acuity as less, less than 618 to perception of light or a visual field less of less than 10 degrees from point of fixation. Now they have sort of um, sort of defined this a bit bit more recently in 2018, uh, and they de defined it in its two groups: distance and near vision. And within the distance um, low vision group, they sort of classified it as mild, moderate, and severe, uh, and blindness. And the mild is acuity worse than 612 to 618. Uh, moderate is visual acuity to, from 618 to 660. And severe is acuity worse than 660 to 360. And blindness of a visual acuity worse than 360. And in the near visual impairment, near visual acuity worse than N6 at 40, uh, 40 centimeters, 
which uh, for me sounds a bit low, but, but, but that's what they've defined it um, to be. Um, so sort of low vision worldwide, the uh, World Health Organization estimate that globally at least 2.2 billion people have a near or distance vision impairment. And at least 1 billion of these cases, visual impairment could have been prevented or is yet to be sort of addressed and treated. And the leading cause of visual impairment and blindness are uncorrected refractive errors and cataracts. Now this is worldwide, not, not UK um, uh, figures. And the majority of people with visual impairment and blindness are over the age of 50 years. And however, as we are seeing in our clinics, um, vision loss affects many people of all ages, uh, including uh, children and sort of teenagers uh, and people below the age of 50. And visual impairment poses an enormous financial burden with the annual global cost of productivity losses associated with visual impairment from uncorrected myopia and presbyopia estimated to be 244 billion um, and, and uh, 24.5 billion from presbyopia. And this is what I've got from the internet. Um, and in the UK, it's estimated cost about 28 billion um, pounds to the economy. From, um, from, from, from low vision and productivity. Um, prevalence in the UK, there's estimated to be almost 2 million people living with sight loss. And this figure doesn't all only include people who are registered, but also those that are waiting for treatment and those whose sight could be Im improved and those who's not been registered yet. So it's quite, a, quite a, a, a big figure of people there that it affects. And as of 2000, sorry, 2017, there are around 350,000 people on the register of blind and partially sighted people in the UK. And a total of 173,735 are registered as severely sight impaired and 176,125 are registered as sight impaired. So we're looking at quite large figures here. Um, and I've put the figures there, approximately 290,000 in England, 17,000 in Wales, 8,000 in Northern Ireland and 34,000 in Scotland. Um, and the number of those people that are sort of registered or have sight loss is expected to raise to about 2.7 million by 2030. And by 2050, the current figure will be expected to sort of double um, to over sort of 4 million. Um, can you stop sharing your screen, Char, um, please? <laughs> Um, and the main causes of sight loss in adults, this is, is, is what I've got from the internet and from the UK, uh, as you'd expect in the, in the UK, the most common cause of sight loss is sort of age related macular degeneration. With 23% of people living with sight loss, it's over half a million cases and the majority of those are women and with an increase in population, 71,000 cases of AM, new cases of AMD every year are reported. Um, cataracts, 19% of people living with sight loss are due to cataracts. And in the UK, age-related cataracts affects around half the people of over the age of 65. National data from across the UK reported that 15% of pa patients have failed to achieve 660 at the time of listing for cataract surgery. So quite a number of patients uh, there. And then glaucoma in third place, 10% of UK blindness registrations are ascribed to glaucoma. And 2% of the UK population over 40 have this condition. And it's a condition that we're seeing is increasing all the time. So, oops, I've gone too far there. So, we often see in our clinics, uh, and you've probably seen it in practice as well, patients come in and say, can't you just give me stronger glasses? Um, now the aim of low vision clinics is to provide advice and equipment for magnification, as well as further information for low vision services available in the area and the community. Um, and we see a lot of patients where sort of, you know, full correction of glasses no longer achieves the level of vision that they require for for day-to-day -day tasks and day-to-day -day living. Um, when we see patients in in the clinics we review them quite regularly and to see if they need any further magnification or, or sort of appointments to help with their, uh, their visual needs. 
So in East Sussex, uh, we run low vision clinics and uh, referrals to our low vision clinics are from community optometrists or from other eye clinics in the department. Uh, in East Sussex, we have uh, approximately four clinics per week that run and they run between um, Bexhill and Eastbourne. We used to have clinics at Conquest, but due to the current COVID situation, uh, Conquest has moved over to Bexhill. And so we have four clinics a week, seeing about 20 patients per week uh, in our low vision clinics, equating to uh, 1,040 appointments per year. And sort of in our trust recently, in conjunction with the RNIB, we have introduced our own eye clinic liaison officer to further assist uh, services available to low vision patients. And I will come on to more of that a little bit later. Um, so what happens in a low vision appointment? A keyboard's got a bit funny. So what happens in a low vision appointment? So when patients are referred in, they, they are triaged and they're put into our, our clinics. Um, and um, we sort of, as you do in, in normal everyday practice, we take a full history and symptoms of the patients, why they are there, what the condition is, if they've been seen in the clinics before. So we often talk about what their diagnosis is, will this progress, are they under any treatments and what the treatment consists of. We ask about their general health, any motility issues, risks of falls, social history, do they live alone, do they have support at home, do they live with, with um, um, siblings or, or family members, how their vision impacts daily living at tasks, what they are struggling with, what areas of difficulty do they have, do they struggle to sort of be cooking and cleaning and reading cooking instructions, that's always a big thing with, with patients I've found that reading the instructions on, on, on packets for cooking is always a difficult one. Uh, for the temperatures and the times for, for cooking ready meals and things like that. Do they currently use low vision aids and what aids do they, they have? Are they currently registered as sight impaired or do they have, um, where, when were they registered? And advising on low vision services and societies in the area. So when patients come in, we, uh, after we've done the history and symptoms and had a discussion with them, we trial them with various magnifiers. Uh, as you see a selection there, we've got stand magnifiers, hand magnifiers and bar magnifiers. We explain to them how to use the magnifiers, what distances to use them with, with those distance or reading glasses. Um, if we find a suitable magnifier, we will then loan the magnifier to the patient. And it's a free free loan to the patient. The patients don't pay for the magnifiers. Uh, and we, you know, we, we explain to the patient that if the magnifier happens to fall or break or they need a replacement, we will replace that magnifier to the patient at no charge. Um, we only ask that if the patient doesn't find that the magnifier is suitable or they don't use it, that they uh, return it to us for, for recycle. Um, and we, we offer follow-up appointments where necessary either by face-to-face -face or telephone. But if a patient is stable and coping, then we don't, uh, we don't offer them a, a follow-up, but they can contact us should they need to. So magnifiers in the low clinic, we have a, a quite a large selection of magnifiers uh, from stand magnifiers, hand magnifiers, and what we call flat field magnifiers, which are dome magnifiers or bar magnifiers. Um, and we will show these to the patients and show them how to use them, see which ones they're comfortable using and if they can cope with them. And then we will give them a, a new magnifier to, to take away. So hand magnifiers, these are typically handheld and quite portable. And the, the most common magnifier that we will give out in, in the low vision clinics uh, and available from um, two times to 12 times magnifiers. Uh, and they're, they're quite useful for, for short-term spotting tasks. Uh, they're quite portable. One thing to note about these is that the higher the magnification, the smaller the lens diameter. Uh, and so it's, um, uh, it's, the field of view is quite restricted. 
and they can use them with quite the, with their distance or reading glasses depending on their preference and they have uh, little LEDs in them with batteries so that they can um, have uh, illumination to help uh, with that there. So, and so my keyboard is sticking a little bit there. So hand magnifiers that we restock there. And the picture on the top right is um, of a selection of stand magnifiers that we have in our low vision department, although we have changed them slightly and they are slightly better design uh, than what's shown in the picture there. And they're available from six diopters to 45 diopters. We normally in the eye clinic record them in their dioptric power because magnification M over four and some, mag some manufacturers use the, uh, the alternative uh, method of M over four plus one. So when we record what power we're giving to the patient, we always record it in the dioptric power. And they go from six diopters to 54 diopters. So about one and a half times to about 12 times uh, magnification um, is what we use in our, in our department, uh, the um, uh, East Sussex Healthcare Trust. And they're available in, in sort of three designs. Uh, aspheric, which reduces thickness and peripheral distortion, apolatic, flat, wide distortion free field, which give good clarity, and the bi-aspheric, eliminating aberrations from both surfaces. I think most of the magnifiers we give out are the bi-aspheric uh, lenses. Uh, and with these handheld magnifiers, most patients can use them quite happily, up to about a six times magnification. Um, when you get above that, the lenses do get a little bit smaller and you get more distortion uh, sort of with them. So the advantages of, of hand magnifiers is that they are, um, uh, the, the eye to the distance lens can be varied. So you can adjust a little bit to get the focus and patients can maintain normal sort of reading distance with what they're holding and by using <clears throat> adjusting the magnifier to the, to the distance that gives them most magnification. And they do work very well with patients that, that have used eccentric viewing. So for patients with macular degeneration, um, most of the ones we give out come with a, a light source. So they have batteries inside them and you can then flick the switch up and, and, and illuminate the prints beneath what you're reading there. And these are easily portable and less bulky than some of the other magnifiers that we give out. So they'll fit into a, a handbag or a pocket quite easily. And the disadvantage, obviously, with hand magnifiers, if a patient's got a tremor, or, you know, they, they, they can't hold the magnifier still, um, it can be a little bit jerky and a bit shaky. So not, not an advantage um, magnifier for that type of patient. <clears throat> so maintaining focus can be a bit of a problem for the elderly if they're having to hold the magnifier at a certain distance from the page to keep the, the focus sort of clear and sharp. And with these, the field of vision is, is limited, especially with strong magnifiers. So the stronger you go, you get a smaller field of view. So the patient's having to move the magnifier back and forward quite a lot to, to sort of read uh, what they're trying to see. So we also have stand magnifiers. So stand magnifiers are basically a magnifier that the lens is fixed from the distance from where you're reading it. So you hold it against the material and then you can move it across. Um, and they're, they're sort of good for reading for longer periods, uh, better than a hand magnifier. Um, available again in from two times to 12 and a half times magnification and suitable for, for patients that can't, they've got sort of tremors or can't hold a hand magnifier steady at a certain distance for freely or for a long time. And they can be used wearing their, their reading glasses with these because the light emitted, the image, the rays emitted from the magnifier are divergent. So they need their reading glasses uh, for, for, for this. So as I mentioned earlier, stand magnifiers are stand mounted. So yeah, it's a fixed distance from the material that you, you want to read. So the, the patient needs to place the magnifier on the material that they're reading, and it has a fixed focal length. So it's, it's quite critical that it's held because I've seen patients that start using like hand magnifiers and bring them back, but it must be held on the reading material. That's 
what it's designed for. And as we were said earlier, it's designed for patients to use with their reading glasses. And the advantage is there are sort of a choice for patients with tremors. So if somebody has a tremor or can't hold a hand magnifier steady, then we would give a stand magnifier uh, to these patients. They are quite bulky and they are quite heavy. So I've often with these patients, if they need to read a letter or something, advise them to use a clipboard to put the letter on to hold the stand magnifier against. Uh, otherwise, whatever they're trying to read can quite fold over and it can be quite tricky to read. The disadvantage is that, again, the field of vision is, is sort of reduced. Um, they can be bulky and heavy and too close reading posture can be sort of uncomfortable for the patient because you're having to sort of reach over the magnifier and make sure you're at the right distance and keeping it flat um, so you can you can look inside it. Um, they are quite useful and they are sort of um, I think more advantageous for patients that need a higher magnification than the hand magnifiers because the hand magnifiers you've got to be really steady when you're holding it and it can be quite difficult especially for a lot long periods with the hand magnifier. Um, so so this is a, a picture of a uh, illuminated stang magnifier. This is one that we do. Um, this is from Eschenbach. And um, it's sort of, it's the, they do from seven diopters to 50 diopters, so about 2.8 2 times magnification, up to about 12 times magnification. And they, they again, they have a light inside them, their LED illumination. They do have batteries that go inside them and it can be sometimes a little bit fiddly for the patients to put their um, the batteries in. Uh, and they have, uh, the LEDs have a choice of three colors. So there's two LED lights in it and you can put little covers over to change the illumination of what you're reading. So you can have it as normal white, you can have a, a, an orange filter or a blue filter, whichever they prefer. And they do come with these little sort of clip on filters that you put over the, uh, the lens there. Uh, and they do come with a, as you can see in the picture, a pouch to store them in. They are, they are quite heavy and quite, can be quite sort of bulky to carry around. So they're not easy to transport around, um, but they are very, very useful. And, and with these, you can angle the lens as well on the top. So you can angle it slightly. So you don't have to have it completely flat. You can, you can angle it back slightly as well. And these are magnifiers that we do give out uh, in our low vision uh, clinic um, there. This particular one here is a Scriber Lux, which is uh, a stand magnifier. Uh, but the advantage of this one is that you can put your hands underneath it. So if you're writing or drawing, um, it's a hands-free magnifier, but it gives you the space underneath to, to put your hands under. So if you're stamp collecting or doing any sewing or anything like that. Uh, and this particular one, we don't, we don't actually stock this one at our trust, but it does come with a, a light as well. So you can switch it on and have illumination underneath it. And it's quite a large size as well. I have seen this one and it's a uh, hundred millimeters by 75 millimeters, which for magnifiers is quite a, a decent size. Um, and they will, they stand, as you can see in the picture, they stand on a desk and then you can put your hands underneath it so that you can do your tasks, whatever you need to do with it there. And they, they, do, come, they do are, they are battery operated uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> this particular one, the mobile Ant LED is a, a small sort of pocket sized uh, magnifier. This particular one has an LED as well. We don't stop this one. We have similar ones to this one. Um, but I, I do quite like this one and I was see, showing it recently. Um, and they're from about four times up to about sort of eight times magnification. They have an LED on them as well and they're quite sort of portable so you can put them in your pocket and it's got a quite a nice hard case on it as well. We don't stock this one at our trust, but for patients that are interested in these, we, we will put them on to the manufacturers or to and opticians locally that will supply these uh, these uh, magnifiers. And they come from Associated Optical, from Eschen, Eschenbach magnifiers from Associated Optical. Um, and they do have a lanyard as well that um, 
you can attach to the magnifier to hang around your neck sort of if you're shopping or out and about it's easy to <clears throat> to uh, transport with you bar and dome magnifiers we do stock at the trust <clears throat> and um, often referred to as flat field magnifiers and these are a single lens of a semi cylindrical or hemispherical form and they're designed to be placed directly on on the reading material um, and we do stock these <clears throat> and I do give quite a few of these out and um, <clears throat> normally for the younger patient they prefer to have these sort of magnifying aids rather than carry a magnifier a handheld magnifier or a stand magnifier they, I think they they look better for younger patients younger patients often don't like to be seen having to use a handheld magnifier or such like and they're quite uh, they are quite easy to use as well and they go directly onto the reading material there's no leds with these so these require the light from the surrounding um, from from your normal light source so um, that's one thing to bear in mind and the magnification is is quite sort of low in these and they're unlikely to exceed three times because of the weight and the size but they are very very easy to use and um, they, they don't look too conspicuous when you're using these sort of magnifiers um, so this is uh, an example of a, um, a, uh, a flat field magnifier and this particular one does have an LED in it there and this is the, the menace looks and it's again, three times magnification of 12 diopters. But this particular one, it's difficult to see from the photo, at the side of it, it does have an LED in it as well. So it's a bit like the, um, the dome magnifiers, but there's an LED attached to the side, which will light up the, uh, the material. Um, again, we don't supply these at the trust, but they are very, very good uh, and can help when the lighting is low. <clears throat> and for looking at, I think this gentleman is looking at, um sort of negatives from a cam from a, a, a film there um but with the, the light on it it does make a big difference there as well but they are quite easy to use and you put them directly onto the reading material that you want to uh, to look at there so we also have a selection of hands-free magnifiers uh, that we give out and the two main types of hand view magnifiers are spectacle magnifiers and spectacle mounted telescopes um, and in the photo here you can see this is a, a clip on um, hands-free magnifier and um, again helpful for patients that suffer from hand tremors or poor dexterity uh, and um, you know wouldn't be able to hold a, a normal magnifier Again, they're available in powers from, as it shows here, uh, 1.7 times to 7 times, so reasonable magnification, and um, they are helpful for tasks that require patients to use both hands, um, so for hands-free working, so if they're doing model making or painting, um, they work quite well. We do stock a selection of these in our trust, uh, and they can be worn with, uh, with a your normal, their normal spectacle prescription or in isolation uh, and this is uh, we'll call a max tv clip um, fortune television as it says uh, and it's a, it's a galileo clip-on system with a flip up lens uh, and clips onto the existing uh, prescription uh, eyewear and um, the pd ranges from 60 to 68 millimeters um, which could be, and they have about a two and a half times magnification, uh, quite lightweight as well, and they're supplied uh, with a hard, hard case. They can be a little bit fiddly to put onto uh, the glasses, um, which is the only thing I would say to patients is that you have to clip the uh, the top together to open up the arms and then pop them onto your glasses. So they can be a little bit fiddly uh, from from that point of, of view there. Um, and then for the patients that struggle with watching television, with there is what we we'll call the Max TV. Uh, now I know my wife gives these out quite a lot, uh, and they're a sort of a purpose-built sort of spectacle telescope, um, if you want a better word. And they, they have about two hundred two point one times magnification, and they're able 
enables patients to see their TV in, in double the size. Uh, and they have uh, an adjustable uh, little clip at the side that you can adjust for the focus, which can be a little bit fiddly at times, especially if patients got poor dexterity. Um, and each eye can be adjusted uh, separately. And they, they have a, a PD range that you can use from um, 60 to 68 millimeters. Um, they are very good. I find that some patients find them a bit fiddly to, to use with the focusing. Um, and the other thing is they, they don't seem to be very robust. I think I've had a few that have come back um, damaged for want of a better word, but um, they can work really, really well, but you've got to be able to keep your head nice and stable and still. If you move your head slightly, the image will move quite a lot. So it's, um, it's we give them that to patients to try uh, and see if they, they like them, or if not, we ask them to return them. But that's, um, we often get asked about what patients can use for, for television. And this is, um, this is the one that I would normally really go for and, uh, and get them to try and use there. So we also have, this is very, very similar, which is called the Max Detail. Um, and it's similar to the Max TV and it's a, a one piece a spectacle mount and it, but it's focused more for, for near vision. So depending on what tests they're doing is because the lady here is doing a bit of sewing. Um, and again, the right and left eyepieces can be adjusted separately and they give about a two times magnification. Um, and again, the PD ranges from 60 to 68 millimetres with a working distance of about 40 centimetres. Um, and we do have these in our clinic and we do give uh, them out there. Um, but they, um, they can be a little bit fiddly for patients to use with the focus inside. Um, so patients need to be educated on, on how to use them and how they work. And, and, um, but they can work quite well. I've had patients that, that really do like these. I've had patients that have returned them as well. But I think um, giving patients plenty of instructions on how to use them is, is really important with any magnifying aid um, that we give out or if, if you're in community, give them out as well. So, and the max detail clip is similar to uh, the previous one, but it clips onto their own glasses. Um, and again, give that a two times magnification. And it's a Galileo clip-on style system with flip-up lenses. And they have a, a working distance of about 35 centimetres and a PD range of, again, 60 to 68, which they all seem to have that sort of PD range. And you can adjust the height of them as well, depending on the detailed work that um, you're doing there. And um, so we have these in our clinic as well that we, 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 we give out if patients do require them. Um, another one is uh, the Labo clip, um, which is very similar to the previous one, um, but it clips on and it sticks quite forward and it gives a two times magnification. Again, a, a Galileo clip on with flip up lenses. And we do have these, I don't tend to give too many of these out there, um, but again, they're great for patients that need sort of their hands free um, for, for doing tasks and um, sort of um, sort of being able to, to use their hands freely there. And they have a, an adjustable lens height as well, so they can adjust the lens up and down for whatever they need. Again, a little bit, can be a little bit fiddly to, to, to sort of fit onto their glasses. So patients need to have the dexterity to be able to use the clip there. Um, so, the other type of magnification is sort of uh, we don't give these out is for closed circuit television, which projection magnification, which one of my slides previously didn't come up for some reason. Um, so um, closed circuit CCTV uh, systems consist of a monitor and a camera and a platform to place the reading text. Um, these can be quite costly and we don't give these out at the hospital. Um, they have a control for the brightness and contrast and change of polarity and the magnification varies from three times to 60 times. So great sort of magnification you can get with these. Um, and the disadvantage is that they can start with from around 1500 pounds and they're not portable. But in, as technology advanced, I, I wrote this um, 
this t this talk of a little while ago, and there are new ones now that you can plug into your TV, which is like a mouse that runs over the text, and you can illuminate on your TV and see quite clearly. Um, TV, which is the TV reader, readers are more affordable and consist of a handheld camera, as I said, that you can plug straight into your TV. The NHS, our trust don't supply these because of the cost of them, but they are available um, from sort of uh, local um, charity services uh, and you can purchase them on, on, on um, Amazon and, and such like there. Telescopes, um, these work on the principle of angular magnification. So they have a, a power of about two to 10 times um, and they can be used for near, intermediate and distance tasks. Um, but the field of view decreases with the magnification. So this is an example in the, in the bottom left hand corner of one that we have and that we, we give out to our, our patients there. And we do have these in our trust as well. Uh, they can be sort of uh, handheld monocular, a clip on design or a bioptic design, which can be mounted on a, a pair of uh, spectacles. Uh, there. Um, we use these quite, I, I use, use them fairly frequently um, for patients to be able to see sort of um, bus signs, uh, bus numbers when buses are coming close to them or from a distance. Um, and looking across uh, the distance, things like that. So they are they are quite useful. Some of them have a, a focus in um, application as well, so they can they can focus to see uh, clearly in the distance there. Uh, and they do come with a, a lanyard as well, so they can hang around their neck for easy um, transportation and uh, portability. Um, so <clears throat> coming on to some of the other uh, aids that are available is. We, everyone has got a smartphone or, or tablets and there are apps that you can now get quite free uh, on, on most of uh, the uh, Apple or Android um, devices and these are some that I just downloaded yesterday to um, to put onto the, the presentation basically we've got tap and see I can see the world and um, visual food visual recognition um, and these are all readily available uh, and free to um, to download as well. So a lot of our patients do have smartphones or have uh, a smart tablet. So we often discuss um, these that are available for them as well um, to download. And we will teach them how to use them as well and show them what um, what's uh, how they work. So non-optical devices, now, we don't tend to give out non-optical devices, but I thought it'd be important to just <clears throat> briefly run through about what's available um, out there as well. Um, and most of these are sort of available from the local societies, uh, from RNIB uh, and places such like and on Amazon as well for them to purchase. Um, so non-optical devices, um, Illumination is very, very important. Uh, and we often discuss about illumination um, in our clinics as well, because um, a lot of patients don't realize that illumination is, is quite important, especially for, for contrast um, and such like. So when we discuss about illumination, the position of the light source is always important. Uh, it should be to the side of the better seeing guy uh, and moving the light closer will, will improve uh, the illumination uh, and improve the contrast as well. Localised task lighting can help for reading uh, using television or over kitchen work surfaces. I think uh, we've probably all got undercovered lighting for our kitchen services and we all switch them on when we're, we're, we're sort of cooking in the kitchen. But with reading, it's sort of, it does help patients if they have an angle poise light behind them. Uh, which directs the light directly onto the, the reading material. And it is quite surprising the number of patients that don't realise that and mention that when they improve the lighting, it, it does make quite a big, big difference to what, what they can see and how they can read. Um, we, obviously, the trust, we don't give out lighting or, or lamps or lamp stands and things like that. But this is something that we do discuss with patients to let them know that these are available. Um, Reading stands for patients with um, 
sort of tremors or posture problems. Um, and uh, these are, are quite useful as well, as you can see from the lady in the picture there. Um, and uh, again, not available on the trust, but um, it's something worth mentioning to patients um, to bring the, the, the prints and the book closer to them. Um, and writing guides, which we don't often talk about these nowadays because um, the, you had writing guides for writing checks, but not many people write checks anymore. Some older patients do. Uh, typoscopes, uh, black cards with a rectangular cutout so they could put over their checkbook to write um, their checks. And you can get typoscopes for, for just writing letters. as seen on the left there with the black lines and the guides for, for writing, uh, writing there. Um, we don't have these, um, but they are available for, for patients there. And coming on to, to the relative size devices, so objects that subtend sort of larger visual angle at the eye, and is therefore it's easier to resolve. So you've got an example here of a, a telephone with the large numbers uh, on there uh, to make it easier to see sort of when they're dialing the numbers. And you can get playing cards um, with uh, the larger symbols on them as well. Um, and even large, large clocks and calendars um, that are available for patients with, with foresight there. Um, and um, these are available from normally local charities um, or from, you can purchase them from, from Amazon or places like that. I keep saying Amazon, don't I? Um, so moving on, um, I mentioned earlier that we have a eye clinic liaison officer in our trust and um, ECHLOs are, are a sort of an important bridge between health and social uh, services and they are central to the well-being of patients in an eye clinic. Um, they are able to, to, to talk about the patient's condition with them, prevent sight loss by talking through treatments and helping people to understand their medication if necessary. They can advise on uh, eye conditions, welfare and benefits that the patients may be entitled to, remaining in employment or retraining, mental health and emotional well-being, children's services and where to get help with difficulties at school and voluntary organisations and local support groups and ECHLOs are able to explain the process of becoming registered as blind or partially sighted uh, and what benefits that brings uh, as well. Um, I care, I clinic liaison offices are, are trained by the RNIB uh, and they do work in uh, most I departments and we've we're, we're looking at uh, our trust to be able to have uh, uh, an ECHLO um, and they can offer uh, they offer face-to-face -face appointments telephone consultations and with our trust they work at Eastbourne and Bexhill there's no uh, service at uh, Conquest currently uh, for these patients but those patients are then sent to Bexhill uh, to see the eye, care, eye clinic liaison officer um, Ideally, um, you should refer, if you want to refer to the ECLO, you should refer to the low vision clinic um, and include the, um, that you'd like ECLO support and referrals should be ideally via the GP, although patients can self refer themselves to the ECLO, but um, because of the way the trust, the NHS works and they need to be linked to a, a pathway, if they're not already a patient of the eye department, they would need to be referred in to see the ECHLO um, via the GP uh, to, be, uh, to put, be able to have an appointment. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the, the ECHLOs can register a patient or, or put forward the patient, not register, but put forward the patient for registration if they think they're suitable. Um, so a patient can be registered as severely sight impaired um, if they are defined as so blind as to be unable to perform any work for which their eyesight is essential, uh, or a visual acuity of uh, worse than three over 60. If they have a visual acuity of three over 60 to 660, but with a moderate constricted field, or a visual acuity of better than 660 with a, a very constricted field. 
a patient can be registered as, as sight impaired if their, their visual acuity is within three over 60 to 660 with a full visual field, or if a visual acuity of up to 624 with a moderate restriction of field of vision, or a visual acuity of 618 or better with a marked gross uh, field defect. And the benefits of registration for, for sight impaired and severely sight impaired is that if a patient uh, is registered, they can, they can have free NHS sight tests. They can get help with other NHS costs as well if they need complex lenses, for example. Discounted rail travel, the disabled person's rail card, which gives them um, about 30% discount on their rail travel. Local bus schemes, uh, free concessionary travel, which covers all of uh, the UK. Exemption from BT director inquiries. Information in accessible formats, which is covered under the Disability Discrimination Act, leisure concessions and council tax disability uh, reductions there. So if a patient is able to be registered severely sight impaired, they, get, they, they may be entitled to these benefits above the sight impairment, which would be um, a blind person's personal income tax allowance, but this is assessed on an individual uh, basis. 50% reduction on TV license fee, parking concessions, so a blue blue badge for if they have to be transported anywhere, um, free postage on items marked for articles for the blind, uh, and they may also be entitled to a uh, free permanent loan of radios, CD, cassette players for talking books and newspapers, and help with telephone installation charges uh, and line rental. So. So how a patient is um, registered is that uh, a CVI form, um, a certificate of visual form, uh, impairment form is filled in and signed by a, a consultant. And there's five copies of the, the CVI form is made available. One copy goes to uh, the patient's hospital notes, copy goes to the general practitioner, the patient also receives uh, a copy of that as well. And a copy goes to the Department of Health um, for their records. And then the final copy goes to the local services. So in East Sussex, um, a copy will go to um, the East Sussex, uh, sorry, um, Eastbourne Blind Society, the Hastings River Valley Association for the Blind and the East Sussex Association for the Blind as well. So they get informed as well when a patient has been registered uh, and we'll contact the patient to see what uh, help and support they need there. If a patient is not eligible to be registered as sign impaired, they can still access many of the services that are available. So for example, they can still um, be referred to the, the low vision clinic so we can help see about magnifying aids and give advice there. Social services, they can, they can also be referred there to see about help for rehabilitation, mobility, uh, and what aids um, they may require at home and for a home visit as well. Um, they can still um, be sort of uh, directed to the benefits and support for disability living allowance, uh, an attendance allowance, or such like, and they can also be um, referred to the, the local blind societies, even without being registered. So they offer support and social clubs, training courses, uh, and they will do home visits as well. Um, and they will make contact to um, the, the patients themselves. Uh, there. So this is an example of a a referral for visual impairment form. And I got this from, uh, from the internet, because this is one of the forms that you can download and you can reuse to refer the patient to social services or the local societies. And it's available on the www.gov.uk site and they're readily available to download. And it's a, you fill a patient's details in what they're struggling with. And you can send that off to the social services or the local societies. Uh, to be registered there. So I'm not sure if you've seen this, but my, my, my computer is going a bit slow when I'm pressing for the next slide. So 
services available in the, the community. Let's see if this works. So services are sort of in our local area. So for those of you who are, are not local to East Sussex, I do apologize, but um, I'm sure in your areas there will be similar um, societies and associations that are available. But within East Sussex, we've got the Eastbourne Blind Society, uh, the Hastings and Rover Valley Association, uh, Voluntary Association for the Blind, and the East Sussex Vision Support, which was used to be the, the East Sussex Association for the Blind, which is based in Hailsham. And these three organisations do all come under the umbrella for the East Sussex Vision Care, but they all offer the same same services. And, and as well as those, you've got Blind Veteran Society, which is the Blind Centre, talk in newspapers, which can be accessed from the above uh, societies. The Macula Society have local groups which meet, and there is one in Eastbourne as well. So in your area, there may be uh, uh, um, a Macula Society local group as well. And there's Age UK East Sussex as well, which is another organisation to offer help and uh, support to patients there. And I think my computer <coughs> is going very slow. So I do apologize if the slides are jumping about. Um, in Eastbourne, I did mention one of the groups, because I live in Eastbourne, we have the Eastbourne Blind Society. Uh, and patients can be referred via their optician GP, or, or they can just self refer. And they're a, a resource center um, providing free and confidential for, support for people with concerns about their sight and offer uh, access to aids and equipment uh, and offer advice on emotional support and practical support. They do have uh, talk in, a talking books library, both on CDs and cassettes for patients uh, or uh, participants. And they organize um, local um, activities, including indoor bowls, uh, Scrabble and bingo, arts and crafts and shopping to, to local um, supermarkets uh, as well and teaching patients how to use IT equipment. Um, and they can they have a website there, eastbourneblindsociety.org.uk. Um, and they have been really helpful. They're a good, uh, good organization to be aware of if you're in this area. And I have got something that's popped up on my screen and Right. Um, oh, I have suddenly got something that's popped up onto my screen, which I didn't want. Bear with me one second. Right. I'm not sure what happened there, but some news article popped up. Um, also in our area as well, uh, and nationally, you have rehabilitation offices for visual impairment as well and they're often shortened to rovies um, and um, they're sent the part of the sensory impairment rehabilitation team um, and they help people with with sight loss to live the life they choose by delivering orientation and mobility services to promote independence and this can be by assessing and teaching how to use a cane um, building on techniques uh, and routes to different sort of shops or, or local centres they want to visit. They offer home visits, um, marking of appliances in the home, sort of on a cooker with temperatures and microwave, uh, and offer advice on, on, on contrast as well. So not having white fish on a white plate, but having dark plates for light foods. Um, they can complete lighting assessments and order lighting if requested for patients um, to be fitted into their home. And they can offer advice on low vision techniques, anti-glare shades, advice on sort of technology, as I mentioned earlier about smartphone apps and tablets and computers and visual impairment uh, awareness training. And patients locally can be referred directly via hscc at eastsussex.gov.uk. But if you're not in this area and they're in a different area, um, you can you know, do Google and, and look up where, where they are available and how to access their services in your area. So how to refer to 
a low vision service. So from, from my point of view, from our, from our service, you know, you can refer via a letter to the GP. Um, we like that because um, I'm used to that. I see a lot of those. Um, you can refer via the low vision leaflets, which you can download off the, the uh, www.gov.uk. Um, and um, I've got an example of that coming up in a moment as well. When you refer a patient to us, please include their latest spectacle refraction and their visual acuities and their diagnosis, if you know what it is, what tasks they are struggling with, um, and if they're registered sight impaired or not, if, you, if they patients know that. And please advise the patient to bring their spectacles and any aids they have with them to the appointment because it is quite surprising the number of patients to turn up to a, a low vision clinic that is, um, have got AIDS or got spectacles, but just don't, haven't brought them with them uh, to the clinic. So please add on your letter or, or ask the patients to bring them that with them. And this is the LVL, the low vision leaflet I mentioned that you can download. Um, I prefer if you just referred in by your normal, normal letter that you use for your practice. But you can download this and it sort of you can highlight you fill the name and um, details in what they're struggling with and this can come to us or you can go to low vision services as well the local societies accept this as a referral there um now i just thought i'd put this in this is what we use in our trust for for doctors to refer um to us from another clinic just to show you what we like to see and you've got the patient name details um previous appointments if they've been seen with us before if they've been registered sight impaired and severely sight impaired or if they're not eligible to be registered um and this is what our doctors use to refer to the low vision clinic and uh my next slide this is the back of the the form which tells the doctors if they can register to sight impaired or severely sight impaired. And at the bottom of this form, you've got a, a useful guide on the what their level of vision is, what magnification we, we may look to start them with. Uh, and it gives uh, a bit of an indication there if a patient's got hand movements, then there's gonna be limited help that we can give. Or if they've got sort of 612 vision, then LVAs may not be ideal for them. And they may just need a, a refraction to be sent to their opticians uh, for that and so just as a take-home message there what should we what should we be doing so um, for yourselves I would say you know, be aware of the current services that are available nationally and locally I've mentioned about the local services here but if you're not in this area look at what local services are available to you and get familiar with them even email them introduce yourselves to them and they are always really really helpful um be able to give advice and uh, information to the patient um and offer task-based magnification in practice if you can so magnifiers and and aids and talk about lighting and, and that sort of thing so i think i've rabbited on for for long enough so uh, just finally special thanks to helen Pegrin, uh my boss at Esht. uh i pinched some of her slides from one of her talks in Hughes from Social Optical, who gave me some information on all these magnifiers, Kim Zogu from East Sussex Blind Society, Jennifer Gull from Rehabilitation um, Office, Rehabilitation Officer uh, from the East Sussex, uh, Darren Piddock from RNIB, uh, and, and Sarah, my long suffering, I didn't put long suffering wife, I just put wife on there, she's changed this um, because I've been <laughs> left this talk to the last minute to write, so I've been pulling her hair out. So thank you very much. I, I think my talk went a bit array because my computer keyboard, some of the slides jumped about. So apologies for that. But I'm going to hand back over to you, Shah, now. And I'm going to stop sharing my slide. Thanks, Ian. I think I need to learn how to stop sharing because obviously my background was still going when you were rabbiting on, as you say. Right, let me see. No open questions at the moment. You've answered everything. That was a very good talk, Ian. Um, Thank you. Whilst maybe people are thinking about asking questions, uh, did you mention what the role of ECLO is in, the, in your talk? So the role of the ECLO 
is sort of to, well, they work in the eye clinic and they're sort of a go between, between sort of consultants and doctors um, <clears throat> and what services are available in the community. So they will, um, they can talk to patients about their diagnosis. Um, I'm just trying to get my full screen on. Um, so they can talk to patients about diagnosis, their treatment, uh, what to expect from their treatment, um, and what sort of help is available in community, whether it be in sort of um, welfare, sort of um, sort of benefits and advice, um, what aids are available, and if they need support with sort of work or accessing sort of services to visit them at home for see that what how they live at home if they need any uh, sort of aid well, there we do actually have a question here how long is the waiting list at the moment from referral to being seen so um our waiting list at the moment is uh about eight weeks for booking a patient onto the low vision clinic service uh, we've got our new echo that has um, started our previous echo unfortunately moved on uh, and we're setting up the clinics for the ECLO. So the ECLO is probably not as long, but for the low vision clinics, um, eight weeks. Okay. Two months. Thank you. So I think it's much better when you are hosting it because I, I obviously am I'm not as good there. I think it's much better when you're doing the talks. Huh? What's that? I think it's much better when you're doing the talk as well. My slides <laughs> are going. I missed a few no, slides. No, no, no. You did. Your talk was very good. I learned a lot. Um, so when is the next talk is, uh, what, what, in October now? Have, do, do we know who's doing it or have I? Uh, no we idea? don't know who's doing it um, <clears throat> yet. We'll put it on the group. Told, but yeah, we'll... I'll have an arm wrestle with uh, Cash and see if I can get into the next talk and then maybe we do one in November. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still have to ask uh, Ed at some point to do a VR talk for us. Um, I haven't forgotten. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ian. As thank always, you. thank you everyone for watching. And uh, uh, thank you very much for stepping in last minute. Oh, hold on, one more question. It's probably from Sarah. I've I may have missed it, but do you use PE lenses in the clinic? And if so, with what success? P do we use what -I. lenses? Peli, P E L L I, Peli. No, we don't. Um, is a short answer to that. So um, um, the success is I couldn't tell you because we don't use those in our clinic. Okay, well, that was a quick answer. Right, what, what are Peli lenses anyway? For, for idiots like me. <clears throat> I don't know, so we don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I can't tell you. So maybe the person who asked, can they, can they tell us what a Peli, Peli lens is? Um, some of the CCTV stuff costs quite a lot of money, though. I remember I uh, referred a patient, AMD patient of mine, to a rep, and um, it's you know it's not cheap. Like mm -hmm. that's a half of about two grand. I don't know if they've come down now, but she did find it quite useful. So, um, what's your opinion on ordinary page magnifiers? Um, well, we we um, have one that we demonstrate to patients, but. Um, I find they're a bit, they're not easy to use because they're quite flexible and they don't offer that great magnification. So we don't give them out. We don't use them. I just find they're not as easy. Um, you have to hold it, you have to hold it quite steady. Um, they, they give low magnification and probably a good field of view, but I just find that they're quite floppy and don't last very long. And just out of interest in who funds the equipment? Because you say you give it to patients and then ask them to bring it back, you know. Um, it comes from the finance for the trust. So we put a request in for um, um, a certain amount of aids when we're running short and then we store them and we give them out. But it comes from the trust budget, I believe. And have, have you ever had problems getting money for it? Um, I've had... Um, questions on why we're ordering what we're ordering and for the cost and do we need to order what we're ordering so but they've generally allowed us to order because we order sort of every sort of three or four months a huge stock and then we hand the stock out so when we order 
we probably put quite a big order through and we have had questions about why are we ordering this do we need to do this but then they've always agreed to to for us to carry on okay um right i'm gonna draw it to a close there there's just one comment saying are pelis related to your prisons which goes completely over my head but i don't know ian, ian can you answer that or does that go over your head too I goes on my head too. I think I um, yeah. Okay, well, Peddy, Peddy as well. I haven't. Good guys. Thank you very much for attending. Um, again, uh, sorry if I'm not as a good host as Ian is, but um, anyway, we all learn. So um, we'll post the next talk for kind of mid to end of October. We'll try and avoid half term or maybe early November, um, and uh, we'll be in touch with the next uh, with the next talk. Ian, once again, thank you very much. And of course, uh, uh, Sarah will kindly put this up on uh, YouTube at some point over the weekend. I'll just uh, just one final point. Um, for those who've attended tonight, I will put the CET on next Monday because I've got a busy weekend and the YouTube video will go up next week as well. Okay, lovely. Th there's one final comment saying, I've used your prisms which were able to be incorporated into lenses rather than the patient being given pedi lenses. Uh, Fresnel place strategic to help people with homeless and Okay, fine. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Take care, guys. Thank and you thanks very much. For Cheers. Bye bye. bye, -bye.